if you're doing things for other people, that's a game you can't win. But if you're doing things truly for you and with nobody or nothing that's involved in the decision, like you were pulled into doing this thing, you can't help but not do it. That's a whole different ball game. But I bet, because I know I've been there, 95% of the things I do are for other people. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's just not healthy because you can't win that game. Win all in, play my cards right. This podcast exists because of the team at CADCM. At CADCM, we make content creation enjoyable. We are on a mission to help leaders create content, content that will improve lives, content to be proud of, content that fosters community. We know through firsthand experience how content brings people together, and we love helping make that happen. We produce podcasts, short form videos, blog posts, and other written works, while also providing support in website development, social media management, and strategic planning. And we would be excited to help you. Visit cascm.com to learn more or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And when I heard you talking about like your travels, you had said we, that like we're going here. We, who's we? So me and my wife. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. So we travel all over the world together. Yeah. It's amazing. Grew up west side of Phoenix, right? West side. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of episodes that you've done. You've done a lot of podcasts and I want to get into that. So your story's out there and we'll link to some of those episodes because I think it's important, first of all, like for people to learn about new podcasts and people are doing good work out there and your story's out there. But I do think it's important for some context in our conversation because I want to talk about a little bit about podcasting and get into the minimalism mindset that the way you have it. But you grew up and you talked about your father not being around, your stepfather not being around and witnessing the world around you as you knew it. Just some background on your story growing up where you grew up. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a, basically a place of confusion plus a place of where I was witnessing a lot of desperation around me. And so I had to quickly figure out what's up and what's down. And the beautiful thing about that kind of upbringing and that kind of early decision is it makes the rest of your life a lot easier because you're able to, as an adult, really clearly depend on yourself first and foremost, because if you're not strong yourself, then you can't help anybody else. It's just like when you're on the airlines and they're like, hey, put on your mask first before you put on the kids. It's like, you gotta first and foremost take care of yourself. And I made that decision at the age of five or six that I'm gonna take care of myself first and foremost, because I wasn't quite sure what to believe about myself, about the world, about other people, what their motivations are. Why is there so much fear and so much anxiety and so much desperation, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. And so I had to kind of figure out like, where's the beauty? Where's the opportunity? And then listen to that inner voice that I always listen to, to be my navigation. Yeah. So you're six years old. You're thinking, obviously you're having different thoughts, maybe not having it as clear as you have it today. How do you... What does that look like? You know, a lot of six-year-olds grow up, they have a mom and dad, they go to school. You know, everyone's got concerns and worries and I get it. It's different for everybody. Do you have any idea like when you first started thinking about this and and what that felt like? Yeah, well, first of all, it felt like just lost, completely lost. And in order to be found or find your way, I had to really figure out, in order for me not to be lost anymore, I have to start challenging myself to figure out if these narratives about the world and about other people are true. And so I started to test that out as I grew. And that's kind of how I thought about it. But really, the only way you can test out these narratives and really like see what's true about the world and yourself is I got extremely curious. And I paid extreme attention to how other people acted, what they said, how they interacted. I was just a sponge. It was like, I would just watch people intently and see how they reacted in different situations. And I would start to connect these dots of why people reacted and did the things they did. And I could kind of understand why they would do what they did. Because I understand as a human, like there's a lot of tendencies we all have, which is typically fight or flight. And there's so many different things we can go into about this topic. But I just paid attention and my curiosity really was my fuel. And it's been really my lifeblood of my business and 
my entire life is curiosity and paying attention to what other people are doing because what they say and what they do are usually two totally separate things. Sure. And so I started paying close attention to stuff like that. And then I would triangulate that information when I'd pay attention to nature quite a bit. I don't care if it was, you know, it, the funny thing about nature is, you know, there's animals and there's plants, right? And there's the ocean and, and what have you. But then there's also this interesting gap between humans where when you pay attention to children and you pay attention to old people, there's a lot of wisdom there. And for some reason, everyone's stuck in the middle in you know, between 20 and whatever, 70 or 60. And that's where all the misery lies for some reason with the human species. Like there's so much misery in the middle age. But if you look at children and old people, you can learn so much about the simplicity or animals too, the simplicity of life and what's really important. And so I would pay attention to that and then I'd triangulate all this information. And then as I got older, I just always wanted to test and challenge myself to see you know, who am I really? What am I capable of? And then what's the world really about? Because I always feel like it's just an opportunity to fully express my creativity. And usually when you do that, you can monetize that. And so that's where sales and entrepreneurship came into play. Yeah. When you're a teenager dealing with this, you mentioned 20. I think maybe it's possibly like 15 or 13 or somewhere in that range where when you're young, you do a drawing, you create a piece of art, you try something different, you play a sport, and then you start noticing that people are laughing, judging, thinking, whatever. And then in different environments, it could be worse, better. And it, you know, it could be someone living in a great suburb of, you I mean, Scottsdale, Arizona, right? And they could be dealing with it. But you, know, you hear stories of, but this is where you're from and this is what you're gonna do and anything else is not acceptable, right? So you have to block out a lot of noise, a lot of conversation that other people are having. Do you have times in your life when you're a teen to think back to say, you're having all these thoughts and you realize you're trying to go in a different direction, but were there the naysayers, the doubters, the non-believers to say, no, Jermaine, like, that's not for you? Not that I can recall or remember, but I am the type of personality at the younger age of, you know, five, six, seven, I blocked out everything. I completely disassociated from everything as far as like, if someone said something to me, it would go in one ear and out the other. Wow. I would literally give it zero attention because I just didn't believe it. I didn't believe anybody but myself. And so from that place, I'm assuming I did have naysayers. I assume people told me stuff, but I certainly did never bought into it. I always thought, hey, that's their opinion. And like, so what? I've never been like, if anyone gives you praise, okay. If someone talks shit about you, okay. Like it doesn't matter either way. Yeah. So I think I've yeah. always kind of developed that muscle. So I just didn't care. Yeah. Like if you're talking to someone now, because a lot of people do care, right? Like being honest, a lot of people do care about both of it, right? Praises, words of encouragement, all that stuff. But also people are worried more about the negative, right? Especially on social media. And you, you hear this stuff, like you can make a post and 10 people love it. And all you need is one person to hate it. And it just sends you down this like, oh man, why don't they like it? Or going back to school, if someone doesn't like the shoes that I wore today, or someone says, oh, you're weird or this or that, like, because that's amazing for you to have that. And you could help others, which I think you do. You help entrepreneurs do it. How would you help a young person avoid all that bullshit? I think one of the important things to do is to challenge whatever the narrative is. So there's a couple of ways you can look at it. You can fight or you can test. And so if someone says something to you negative, you can hit them right back with you know, whatever rebuttal you want to stand your ground, if you will, right? Which I think is great. But there's also a way to say, okay, whatever. And then you test that hypothesis in your life. Because the thing about it, if someone says you're ugly or you're fat or whatever, you can internalize that and be like, okay, maybe I am fat. So how about I lose 20 pounds? Like use things as fuel. Like there's nothing wrong with negativity. I think negativity is like the shadow that we all see. I mean, some of us see, but some of us don't see it. So maybe it's good that they said something to you so you can bring it to, to the light. So I would never take negativity or naysayers or haters as a bad thing. I think it's actually a good thing because they're either gonna shine light on something you didn't see, or it gives you an opportunity to test a hypothesis about yourself to see if it holds any weight, or you can just hit them right back. So it's like, obviously you don't wanna be an eye for an eye as far as like evil intent, but you never wanna be someone that cowers to you know, haters. Like 
for the most part, if someone tries to call me out on like on social media or something, I'll hit them right back. I'll put their whole name in headlines. I'll have a whole post about this person because if you're saying something that's not true and you're just quiet about it, I don't know. I just feel like maybe I'm not being the biggest person there, but I don't know. I put people on blast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's kind of fun because it's just a game. I don't know. It's just, there's different ways you can skin that cat. You just got to figure out what's best for you, but you always want to come at it from a place of how can I turn this lemon into lemonade? And so if I can make a great post about someone's hating me on me, great. If I can come back with them with a wise crack that makes them maybe laugh, great. If I can take what they said to me and make myself a better person, because maybe they do see a blind spot that I don't see, great. So I'm always looking to make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, you're reframing it. I also think that person who came at you and they didn't realize like what you're coming at them with, they might stop. They might not do that to the next person. You know, hopefully they'll reframe, but maybe not, right? It's toxic. I think what you're also doing is you're avoiding the victim mindset, right? Because it's very easy because if someone constantly is calling you that and it's not just one person, maybe it's numerous people and you've heard it throughout, like you said, you can play the role of victim very easily and get lost in that. But this is important, like you sharing this because, and I've always said, I could have a podcast. I could talk to people like yourself, Jermaine. And in their own time, my kids could at some point listen to this. My son can hear how you deal with this stuff. That's it for me. That's why I do this. And I could get something from it because I think there's just so many different perspectives out there. And people come from so many different places to say, wow, how you grew up and your father wasn't around. And to think about these things at such a young age, why would we not want to take something from that and learn from it and just, what does that all mean? And just have conversations. So I'd imagine that's why it's important for you to come and share these stories on, you know, obviously you have a business, you're generating a lot of revenue, you know, you're creating a lot of sales, but you're taking time and we'll get into the minimalism thing. And this is part of it to show up on this podcast today. Like you have a lot of things that you could be doing and yet you're here on this podcast and you've done it on other podcasts as well. Why? I don't know when I wrote this in my journal. This was probably, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago. I remember vividly, I wrote, I'm going to share my story. And so I've never known the best method to do it, but I always love conversations. And so for me to share my story, because I know there's other people in the same predicament, it might look a little different. Like I always have the saying, like we're all living the same life. It just looks a little different, but we're all doing the same thing. And I've always told myself I'm going to share my story because I know it can help people. And also for me, it's a living journal. It's like when I'm talking to you about my life, it's like me journaling, but contributing to the, the greater sum of the world. And so it's like, why would I just journal to myself by myself when I have a conversation with you about myself, about how I'm thinking, about what I believe? Because when you talk about what you believe, when you speak what you believe into the world, you embody that in your day-to-day -day practices. And so it's so important just to, why are we hiding from it? There's nothing to hide from. So just tell your story, whatever it is. Who cares? It doesn't matter what people think because the truth is the truth. If this is what happened to you, this is what happened to you. If this is what, how much money you made, this is how much money you made. Is this, you got the divorce, you got the divorce. Like, who cares? And so it's like, I think it's important that we all share whatever our story is and not from a place of victim, but from a place of being a creator because I believe we all create our reality and every moment is an opportunity to create a new reality. And that's the beauty of life to me. And that's the beauty of business. and our human connection is all about that. Like it's about sharing, it's about understanding, it's about challenging each other, it's about growth. Yeah. And the only way you grow is through connection and community. Do you ever see it, you hear about when it comes to creating content, the ROI comes up. Well, if I'm gonna do this, I need to make a certain amount of money from it. And a lot of things that you talked about are, how do you measure the ROI of a connection, of a conversation, of you getting to share your story, of you journaling and feeling better about it. I agree with it, right? I've written articles, I'm like, I would step back and like, why am I doing this? And I would reread some stuff. And I'm like, I'm talking to myself. If someone else reads it, amazing. But I'm literally talking to myself. And like you said, embodying. I'm like, yeah, 100%. And how do you measure that? I don't know. I really don't. My business partner is like spreadsheet, ROI stuff, an m and guy, like the whole thing. And he can even see it. He's like the intangible that comes from that. Like you cannot measure certain things. I heard it from an engineer once. And he's like, you can't spreadsheet this shit. At the same time, I get it. There's businesses to run. People need to make money. How do you look at it from like an ROI perspective of taking this hour and that, or are you literally just looking at it from like these 
alternate benefits that you could possibly not even know what they would be? Like, how do you see that? Yeah, I see it through the latter. I don't think about ROI at all when it comes to content or conversations or podcasts or, I mean, I really don't think about ROI at all when it comes to the free parts of life. This is free. This is a free interaction. Now, if I'm paying ad spin or something, then I'm going to look at ROI, obviously. But if like social media and just talking to people and podcasting, I don't think about ROI because I believe the more you speak truth and your truth, the more doors are going to open for you that you didn't know were even possible that could be open and connections that can be made. So I don't even care. I just enjoy talking to people about my life, their life, again, talking to myself about myself to strengthen my conviction and what I want and what I believe in. Because if you don't talk about it, you're going to forget what you believe in. And so it's like, the more I can do it, the more I'm clear about my direction. It's just This helps in all facets of life. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that makes so much sense because it's so true. Like, just keep talking about it, keep sharing it, keep reading about it. It's funny, I try to control my feed because I'm going to get, you know, with content production companies. So I'm going to be on social media, but I'm not doing it more from a personal thing. Maybe, maybe self-development, looking for interesting things, discover new people, books, what have you. And I read, this is wild because I read this today, which I just seen the movie, you read the book, The Fight Club. Chuck Palahniuk, and he says, and Brad Pitt says it in the movie, the stuff you own ends up owning you. And I know you talk about this a lot, and this is getting into the minimalism thing. When I read that, like what's coming to mind for you? For sure, because you become a slave to it. I mean, and this can be digital stuff too. It doesn't have to be all physical, tangible stuff. This can be digital stuff. So like you were saying, like if you're addicted to your Instagram or your whatever, then your time, your precious time on this earth is owned by somebody else or something else. And so like the whole American dream thing is kind of funny. Like, you know, everyone wants to buy a home, but now you're a slave to the mortgage. Now you're a slave to that city. Now you're like, you want to go on a vacation or even pets. You really can't go anywhere because now you got to take care of your pets or you got to figure out a place to put them or you got to like, there's so many things that are moving parts when I'm really into the shared economy where you can share cars, you can share homes. Like I live out of Airbnbs. There's no reason why you need to own all the stuff because at the end of the day, it doesn't bring you any happiness. Sure, you can get a little dopamine hit when you have a new thing for a week, but like if anything has to be refueled, it's not real. So that's why I'm not even a real like proponent like meditation and stuff because if I got to do it every day, then it's not real. It doesn't work. It's something that is fleeting. And so like my whole thing is like I'm looking for things that are not fleeting. I'm looking for things that are everlasting, that are in the thing that's everlasting is like our awareness right now of this conversation. Like the me and you being here talking right here right now that this moment will never come again and we may never meet or speak again, but we're here right now. That's something that lasts forever. And so I think it's important to always think about what are the things that last forever and that always fill you up and everything else is just peripheral. And there's um, Duolingo, Snapchat, Headspace, these things. It really, there's this gamification going on. So... If we have a Snapchat, kids do this, they have a Snapchat streak. So we just keep it going. Well, so like you said, you're being owned by the app. Like Duolingo, you're learning another language. I think there's a lot of positive in that. But you have to show up every day to do it where it's like, why are you doing it, perhaps? And I'm not judging for it. My daughter uses it. And I think it's great because you know she can learn French more, right? And she enjoys it. And that's fun. I think maybe there's an awareness piece of it. So when you realize you're not doing it for that anymore, like you're actually being owned by the app, I have to show up because Headspace says, they show me the streak after I meditate. And it says, you've done it for this many days in a row. And here's how many minutes you've done it for. Are you doing it for those right reasons? So when you say that, it definitely brings that up in my mind. So obviously people are going to own homes. They're going to have dogs. They're going to own stuff, right? I don't think the expectation would be fair to say everyone should do exactly how you're doing it. I would imagine you would agree with that. I think at the same time, if someone wants to explore how you're living your life, absolutely. And that's why you're here and talking about this story. Because there's extremes to all of this. Like, how would you look at that? Because someone say, I love having a dog because I just enjoy being around a dog. I like taking my dog on a walk. And maybe it's having the understanding that I'm going to have to board the dog because I'm going to travel. I'm going to go do this. Understanding that people are going to own things How do you look at that? I don't see you as someone who's sitting there judging that, right? But how do you look at it knowing that people will at least own some stuff, but can they maybe from their own perspective, if they need to let go of some other things that aren't important? 
see what I'm getting at. Yeah, I mean, everyone has to live their own journey in, in their own life, so they got to figure out what's best for them. And I think people are so different, but also so similar because I think it's just a level of awareness. If you've never got rid of something you cherished, then you're you don't really know what that even means to let go. And I always feel like letting go of something physical is the easiest way to start letting go of something internal because we all hold on to different things. And so if you can let go of something physical, then you can start to let go of internal things and maybe you don't need a meditation app anymore. And so you just got to start small. For me, I started small and I don't think there's a right or wrong. Like for example, like you talked about your daughter learning French or you know people buying houses or whatever. The way I try to think about it is, why am I doing this? And most of the time when I actually reflect on some of the things I have done in my past, it's never for me, it's for other people. I'm doing this to tell people I'm a meditator. I'm telling people that I speak French. Now I have status, right? right. Or I have this home in Boca Raton or whatever it is, right? And so if you're doing things for other people, that's a game you can't win. But if you're doing things truly for you, and with nobody or nothing that's involved in the decision, like you're pulled into doing this thing, you can't help but not do it. That's a whole different ball game. But I bet, because I know I've been there, 95% of the things I do are for other people. Yeah, yeah. And so that's just not healthy because you can't win that game. Yeah. And so the first step is realizing, oh, here I go doing things for other people to get their favor, to get my status higher, to be you know, looking better in their eyes when I should be focused on like what really fills me up. Yeah, and we're caught up in this culture right now. It's really tough with social media, right? So people will travel. You're traveling for yourself. That's it, right? Because that's what you want to do. You don't need to tell anybody about it. You're telling people about it today because I'm asking you about it and you're going to go and do it. You know, Instagram, Facebook, this is the vacation they went on. This is the trip they're doing. This is the that. This is the car they got. This is their home. This is the team that their kid plays on. I'm not saying that stuff's not important to them. You talk about the shared economy. It's also the sharing economy or the sharing world. And they call it sharenting as an example for parents. And that's a lot because like you said, I agree. I do not think that's a game you can win. It's really tough when someone gets caught up in it to get off of that. I mean, I'll talk to people. Labor Day just happened, right? As we were recording this a couple of weeks ago. And the question is, where are you going? Like, where trip are you going on? Are you going out of town? Because I could understand, I love traveling. But a lot of times, it's also nice not to travel for someone. And just, I'm here. I'm going to go to a park. I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to dinner with my kids. Or what have you, right? When I say all that, and just like the world we live in today, it's different than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, just a few years ago. And, and I don't know what direction it's going because these things are very powerful and controlling people. Like, what comes to mind for you? Well, yeah, our mind is never built to be on these digital devices for thousands of years, we've never had these type of setup. And so now it's like, everything's at our fingertips. Everyone has a voice if they want to use it. They can say whatever they want on any platform. And so I think it's interesting. I think it's a, a net net good though. I would never say it's a, a negative because I think the whole point of life is to express yourself. And if you want to express yourself however you want to express yourself, I'm okay with it because I'm like a true American as far as this idea of free speech. I don't care what you got to say. I give you the right to say it, even if I don't agree with it. It's fine with me. I don't care because I don't have any attachment to it. Like if you say something that I don't agree with, okay, I don't agree with it. So what? And then so I think it's just a matter of accountability. That's like one of the most powerful things you can ever have is accountability, personal accountability. And so if you start to notice that you're having problems in your life, maybe because of social media or because of the devices or because of whatever you're doing or you're getting overweight or you're dead, whatever it is, you have to stop yourself and say, okay, now it's time for me to course correct and put my foot down and take responsibility for my life and my outcomes. And this goes back to that victim versus creator mentality. We can create whatever we want. We can create you know, millions of dollars. We can create six pack abs. We can create whatever we want in life. Or we can also be a victim of a story that we made up about the past or about the present. And so it comes down to accountability. Yeah. I think that goes back to what you're talking about before is hearing some negative comments about you. Because I think what's hard is some people don't want to hear it. There's so much stuff. There's so much content. Like here's a podcast, here's a movie, here's a TikTok, here's a book to read. It's just never ending. But if you can find the negative that is being said, and like you said, use it as a tool, I suppose, 
to get better, to create awareness. It's just hard because there's so much that we have going on that we don't hear the noise. Like we don't hear that. Like we don't want to hear the negative where you're talking about before that. If you allow maybe some of that negative to hear it, to say, well, maybe I maybe need to be accountable to myself. Maybe I need to be aware that I am doing this and how can I fix that? Because I think people can change. It takes a lot. It's hard. It's not easy. And I think letting go of stuff. I just seen this right before we started talking. Ryan Holiday, I guess, interviewed Matthew McConaughey. And, you know, he's talking how he talks. And, and I don't know when this was, but he got a call and I guess he had a record label of some sort and he had the production company. And he's about to pick up the phone to talk to him. And he said, I don't want this. And he calls his lawyer, says, just cancel it. Or not cancel it. Like, let give everyone a severance. I want to shut this thing down. So he had all these things and he had all these campfires going on. I have like eight campfires. I got to get rid of five of them and just stopped doing it. That's like liberating. It's freeing. It's all this kind of stuff because entrepreneurs can come up with all these ideas and have all these different businesses and you have to do all the different things and deal with all the different fires that come with it. But it's hard to know like when to give those things up or when to push in a direction of something else. And I'm sure you've seen this maybe with yourself and with others, but you see what I'm getting at when it comes to all these different projects and tasks and companies that we as entrepreneurs want to take on. But man, it's just like, you can just continue adding to the deck, but then you got to clean that deck up constantly. And that's a lot. It's a lot for us to deal with. And I say that, yeah, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, for me, like the most powerful thing you can ever do is subtract. Like subtraction is like one of those things that is a superpower. Because when you subtract things out of your life and out of your, you know, businesses, if you will, then you can actually have focus. Because like when you focus on one thing, one channel, one avatar for 10 years, like your life's easy. <laughs> it's not hard. Super easy. You have everything you want, all the money you want. Things get really efficient because you're not spread thin. Like these serial entrepreneurs are always funny to me because they never are successful. There's this pattern of entrepreneurs where they do the next shiny thing until they hit that next roadblock and they quit and try to find the next shiny thing. And this pattern repeats over and over and over again. And they're mediocre at best at anything. And so like, I've always been one of those type of people that I'll focus on one thing my entire career because my whole thing is mastery. I'm trying to master my time, my money, my location freedom, my time freedom, everything. And the only way to do that is to focus on one thing. As long as that one thing is highly leveraged, then this is a smart decision. So I'm always trying to eliminate as much as possible. I don't care if it's my physical stuff, my mental baggage, my business stuff. Like I'm trying to eliminate as much as possible and just keep things super, super simple. And then lean into where my strengths are. Like my strengths are, you know, writing and talking to people and conveying my ideas. So why would I be focused on other things when I can outsource that and find experts to do things that I don't like doing and I'm not good at? Yeah, I love that. When you had reached out and you would be in the show, I told you because you're from Arizona and I was going to be spending some time in Arizona because my son's going to school at your rival school at AS. You said AS who? I love that. So I was just talking to him and he's a great communicator, right? And other people have told him this, like that's where his strength lies. And I said, imagine Steph Curry playing basketball and just not shooting threes. That's his strength. And I guess this is an extreme we're talking about here. I'm not trying to compare him to Steph Curry or anything like that. And he doesn't have a great three-point shot. He's better inside. Anyway, imagine Steph playing and not shooting threes. Like that's his strength. So I said, imagine you not trying to make a connection in person with your professors. Why would you do that? Like your superpower, your strength is communicating with people. Go do that. And just like you're talking about communicating and writing and talking to people, making connections with people. Like, I love that. That awareness. And maybe my son needed to hear it from somebody else and needs to hear it from other people, just like you had to hear it at times and I had to hear things at times of what we're good at and just taking that and being accountable to it and going and doing it. But man, Jermaine, this is great. I appreciate you reaching out. I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to connect and talk. How do people learn more about you, your website, anything else, and they can find out what you're doing? Probably the best way is craterslearn.com. And the reason why it's called Creators Learn because like, again, we create our own reality. So it's a place to learn about my business model. And if you want to be part of it, you can learn more there. And one thing that's kind of funny is like with the socials, they're so finicky because I tend to get kicked off social media quite a bit. Like LinkedIn, I've been kicked off two or three times now. And so 
always have this like kind of adage where it's like, it's not adversity, it's just an adventure. And so it's like, no matter what happens in your business or your life, you're going to be okay. There's always going to be a way to find the solution you're looking for, even if it's not the necessary way you thought it would be. And so if people want to learn more, just go to creatorslearn.com and you know, always focus on finding a way, not finding excuses. That's awesome. I got to ask, like, do you know why you might have been kicked off of LinkedIn? My guess is that I travel around the world and I'm posting from a new country every two or three months. And they probably think mm. I'm like it's a fraudulent account right. or something. Because can you imagine the percentage of LinkedIn accounts that do that? Point zero 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 one. Yeah. So they're probably like, this seems too suspicious. So, you know, it's like, and plus I'm like on Navigator, I have all these, you know, I'm paying, like I'm paying them. Why would I be like, so silly. So like, that's why I don't give out socials because I never know which yeah. one I'm going to be on. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. That's wild. Well, you could see, because I could h- go hire someone in all these different countries and everyone could have access to my account and they're all liking and boosting stuff and it's all BS, you know, they yeah, have the algorithms exactly. and computers out there trying to figure it out. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Man, this is great. Thank you, Jermaine. Thank you, man. In case you haven't noticed, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're building a -a one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network.